1 Peter chapter 5, I hope that you are there. We're going to take a running start at this. We had done the first four verses out of the chapter. It is what it is, uh, but I pray that you hear it, you listen to it, and that you know, listen, and that you know what the heart of a shepherd should be by now, right? He's not in it for filthy lucre. I like that, what the King James says, filthy lucre. He's like, ooh, I don't want that. Shouldn't be in, man, for self-seeking reasons. He shouldn't be lording over the congregation, right? Lording over. No, you're not allowed to marry her. No, you better not marry him. Uh, these two families wouldn't be good together. We don't feel the Lord is in the... You got no place in that. You got no place. And that's one area. That, listen, husbands and wives, you know that I love marriage. I love the institution of marriage. I want to see your marriages healthy. Uh, we have a, a small group for marriages uh, that is going well. And, uh, but my heart is... I don't want to get involved between a man and a woman um, unless they're seeking guidance and help. And then we walk very, very carefully. We give them only Scripture, right? Solo Scriptura. That's all we ever give them. We don't give them anything. Not my opinion. Well, I know the Bible says that the husband should lead, but if the wife is a better leader, then she should lead. Shut up, right? Right? And then the church has overstepped its bounds, and now it stands on heresy. So we want to be very careful. We don't want to come between a man and a woman, but we are here to bless and we are here to help. And, and let me just say this as a public announcement. If your marriage, it, man, it's going through some stuff. And in the days that we live in, your marriage is going through some stuff, okay? There's going to be some conflict. There's going to be some issues. Listen, from the bottom of my heart, let me tell you something. Don't allow the small, stupid stuff to get in the way of the glorious stuff, Amen. okay? God is doing something glorious through your marriage, and Satan will bring up the stupidest little arguments that flare into this big explosion, usually when you're coming to church, okay? And, and he loves it because you get out of the car and somebody goes, hey, how you doing? Blessed. You just were yelling at each other. Eh? Blessed. <laughs> Satan made you a liar. He wins. But don't, be, don't get beat up by that, okay? Listen, don't allow the silly, stupid stuff to get in the way of something beautiful that God has put together. If you're not sure why, why are we even arguing about these things? Understand, all you're doing is pleasing Satan. That's not God's heart. Husbands, and you know, I always speak to my brothers. Husbands, take your wife by the hand. Look her in the eye. Not one eye on her and one eye on the ball game, right? I've been guilty of that. No, grab her by the hand, look her in the eye and tell her, babe, I love you. We're going to get through this. I don't know what's happening, but I take full responsibility. I know most of it's your fault, but I'm going to take responsibility. No, don't say that. <laughs> Listen, get over it and get through it because you can't fight Satan on your own, okay? Two are better than one. You can do all things through and in Christ, and how much the better when the two of you are on the same page. So listen, today, get on the same page. I don't even know why I went there, because that's not where we go. But this, this is what a congregation should be expecting from their pastors, right? Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we give you the word. We thank you, Lord, for everyone that's here, Lord. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you, Lord, that we have a congregation that knows how to move in when we need extra room in the seats, Lord. Uh, we haven't had to do that in a while, Lord. We, we, we thank you uh, for everyone's attendance here in the summertime, and we thank you for those watching online, and we thank you, Lord, for what you'll do in your house today. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. There is none like you. Lord, and as the song says, Lord, we, we could search all eternity, and yet we'll never find anything or anyone like you. Thank you for being the center of our worship, the center of our lives, and reason why we even breathe, Lord. We love you. Bless this time in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. amen, amen. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I'm encouraging them. I'm lifting them right now. Listen, he goes, and I'm also a fellow, a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Again, all this is from last week, just a refresher. 
and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, he says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not dictators, overseers, oversee the congregation, make sure the congregation is healthy, make sure the congregation is blessed, make sure that they're safe, got to oversee these things. Sometimes we're overseeing security. Sometimes we have to oversee cell phones going off during a message. Sometimes we have to just watch how are the kids doing? How's the children's curriculum? We have to oversee all of these different... And listen, and I wouldn't wish being a pastor on anyone. Some of you, you know, are being called into the ministry. Understand that being called into the ministry is not being called into something glorious. You are being called to come and die to come and die. And if you're not ready to die, don't step in. Don't step in. Why? Because it'll kill you. It will kill you. You see see men that have jumped into the pastorate, had no business being there because they didn't have a heart for this. And they get crushed. And then they don't even want to attend church after that. (laughs) These men end up driving cabs or Ubers or whatever else. Whatever they can do to get away from people because it wasn't their call. This has to be a call. Has to be a call. There are a bunch of guys in, in, in you know, going to school right now in cemetery. Uh, you know what I mean. And they're doing it. Why? For the money. For the money. You're doing this for the money? What do you live in Mongolia? You don't do this for money. There ain't no money in it. Hey, you put food on the table. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll live, but you don't do this because, oh, I'm going to get wealthy. Said no pastor at any time, unless you're on television, <laughs> unless you're on TV. If you get on TV, eh, you get a nice fancy hairdo, apparently, I guess. You get a bunch of big, shiny white teeth, and you always had a, a rag in your hand for some reason. I can't figure that part out, but you get all the prestige. Let me tell you something. At the end of the age... As Peter puts it here, the glory that will be revealed. When Jesus Christ is revealed to them, I don't want to be anywhere near them. I, I, I just, I, I fear for them. I fear for them because they've been warned over and over and over. And what if we only had one scripture? What if it was the scripture, listen, that teachers will be judged more strictly? <sighs> That's crazy. That's crazy. Why would you mess around? Why would you not protect sheep? Why would you not look out for a congregation knowing that God is going to hold you accountable? God holds me. Again, me, Pastor Matt, Pastor Isaiah, Pastor Jack. He's monitoring, you know, he's monitoring online. Pastor Jack will be held responsible. No, not me, bro. Him. <laughs> Love you, Jack. Man, serving as overseas, not by compulsion, not because you have to, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Nor being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, Lord Jesus Christ, appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Verse 5, likewise, you younger people. This word younger actually means in age. You younger people, younger adults. But it also means those younger in the faith, people that have just gotten saved. Uh, To a point, to a point. Let me clarify that, right? Submit yourselves to your elders. You know, in the world that we live in, submitting to elders, it's, it's, you don't find it anymore. Not even in the churches do you find submission to elders. They'll submit to rock star pastors. They'll submit to celebrities. They'll submit to evil. We, we tend to embrace rebellion in our nation today. And a lot of that has crept into the church. I mean, we see people celebrating in the streets over evil. 
And then we see them calling for death for someone who doesn't agree with them. Gang, it's a chaotic world. And Satan, and you say, well, it's never been like this before. Well, that's true. But the reason is that Satan, the Bible told us in the last days, he would be wiling. And that's what we're seeing. Satan is wiling right now. Okay? He's got his demonic forces on full alert. Go after everything and anything. Whatever's on the table, knock it off. Let's, let's just turn this country around. Let's have Russia invade the Ukraine. Let's have people come after each other just because they don't like their skin color. Let's mix up the world. And we see it happening in our day. But Peter says, hey, you younger people, I know you think you're hip and you got all the electronics down pat and you know how to break into a bank vault online, whatever. Listen, submit to your elders. Submit to your elders. And, and I love that verse. I got to be honest. I love that verse. And, and I'm not so young anymore. But there was a time when we planted this church. Man, I looked to all the older guys. I looked to all the older guys. Why? They've been there. They've lived it. They've been through it. I wanted to hear what they had to say. As long as they were believers. How would you do this? What would you do here? And it's amazing how, you know... <sighs> One guy who comes to mind, Doug Mossberg, loved the Lord with all his heart, but he had some grit. But at the same time, he had grace. And, you know, and, and sometimes I'd put him to the test. I don't know, Doug, should this person's message, should we just ask him to leave the church? No. He was from Minnesota. And uh, there would be other times where he'd just come to me and go, you need to ask these people to leave the church. Where's Mr. Grace? But he'd lived long enough. He had seen enough personalities. He'd seen this happen enough in the church. He had experiences that I never had. Peter says, hey, younger people, do something wise. Do something that is, 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 is good in God's eyes. Man, submit yourselves to your elders. Not just sons to dads or daughters to moms or daughters to mom and dad. It means that, but it means more than that. It means in the church structure. Man, listen to the elders. We have, we have people appointed. We have pastors, elders, deacons. We have people appointed, listen, that have received that position from the Lord. We don't give that position to anybody. It's the Lord that raises a man up. And again, we take it to the Lord. And we, and we ask peers, we ask brothers, hey, what do you think of this man? You notice anything in his walk? Anything that we should maybe like hold off? These men are appointed by the Lord. Um, he says, yes, all of you now. Now he says, all of you, be submissive one to another, to each other, and be clothed, listen, the clothed, and the, and the word there for clothed is what we would call for slaves' clothing, servants' clothing. It's an interesting use of the word right there in the Greek. Be clothed with humility. Be humble. Be humble. Uh, you, you, you might be built like a tank and you can take on a city. But there's an older guy coming to you and saying, hey, you know, I hear the way you're talking to people. And that's rude. Don't go and tell him to shut up. Don't try to bully him. Listen to what he's got to say. Hear him out. Chances are he's right. You know why? He's probably seeing something in you that he saw in himself. He knows the mistakes that he made in his life. And now he's trying to correct a, a younger brother. Man, we need to submit one to the other. Uh, you know, uh, some of our, uh, I, don't, I can't say old ladies, that's not right. Older, our older female saints. Huh? Huh? Politically correct, I guess. I love when they come around a younger woman. I love that. Look, I don't know what it's like to be a woman, obviously. But I know it can't be easy. The world is pulling at you to get a job and to make a lot of money. Scripture's telling you, hey, man, be a, be a chase homemaker. Help, you know, your husband raise kids. 
Oh, I, that, that seems so antiquated. I don't want to do that. But I really do want to do that in my, and you're being pulled in every direction. My, my younger sisters, man, speak to some of the more seasoned sisters and ask them, hey, what, what did you do? How did you do? Older sisters, listen, speak to the younger ones to love their husbands. Man, to, to honor their husbands, to respect their husbands. Because I'm going to tell you right now, there's not a widow in this church right now that doesn't miss her husband. And, and if he was a good husband, she dearly misses her husband. Dearly misses him. Can't wait for heaven. Can't wait to be reunited. Did she think about that when he, he was alive? Probably not, because we think we have forever. It's never going to end. No, no. One day it's going to end. If the Lord doesn't rapture us out of here, listen, our marriages, one is going to pass before the other. You know, we need to face that. Older generation needs to tell the younger generation how painful that really is and what it's like and the loneliness. Honor and cherish and listen and enjoy every single day. Enjoy every single day. I think one of the, the I got to be careful. Imagine I don't finish this chapter. Oh, my goodness. We're going to just serve. I don't know what we're eating today, but we'll serve it in here, okay? I think one of the most valuable lessons I learned in my life is seeing my three older children get married and have their own lives. And I look back and I went, where did the time go? I, I was just beating this one for stealing chocolate. <laughs> and now she's beating her own for stealing chocolate. It runs in the family. But where did the years go? So listen, I've learned to slow it down and to cherish the days. I didn't take a vacation, gang. I didn't take a vacation for close to 10 years serving in the ministry at the price my family paid. Because me, I'm, I'm a dude. You're a dude, right? Just wind us up and we just, I go do this every day. This is what I do. And, and we're fine. But my family pays the price. So now I take time to watch them grow, to watch them thrive, to watch them be what the Lord has created them to be. And, and listen, and I've been blessed. I got three great kids, and I love their spouses. They're my children. Their spouses are my kids. But I miss those days because I let them fly by me. I'm not making that mistake anymore. That was a lesson I had to learn by watching my three older ones. And I tell my kids, hey, don't let these years pass. Get involved in your kids' lives. Even when they spill milk at the dinner table, it's not funny now, it will be someday. It will be someday. But be humble, you know, with humility. Why? Why? Because ultimately, listen, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives favor. Therefore, right, what's it there for? Because God resists the proud, humble yourselves so that God doesn't have to humble you. Humble yourselves. And you don't want to be resisting God, right? We're here to serve the Lord. How horrible would it be to find out Man, we're resisting God. God's telling us to be humble and in our pride and our arrogance we're moving. No, no, no. He resists that. He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And listen, if you humble yourself, I promise you, the day is coming where God will exalt you. God sees everything. You humble yourself. Uh, you know, let somebody do you wrong and take it for the kingdom's sake. And watch how God avenges that. 
Watch how God does that. Watch how God promotes. Again, I could give you more stories. I'll spare you. And he says that he may exalt you in due time. Listen, casting, please circle in your Bibles the word all. Casting all your care. What's that picture? I got these cares. I've got these worries. I've got these concerns. He says, man, take those cares and cast them. Those of you that like to fish, my wife likes to fish. I don't like to fish. I'm a fisher of men, not a fisherman. I've said that before. I'll say it again. I don't like slimy fish. I don't like standing out in the sun sweating. It just makes no sense to me. And then you work all day to catch this thing, and then you got to put it back. What in the world are you thinking? (laughs) But cast. I watch her out there. She casts. It's a picture for me. That's what I'm to do with my cares. Why? I'm going to cast them upon the Lord. And you know why? Because he cares for me. He cares for me. And let me add this. God wants all of your heavy burdens. Every one of them. God wants those burdens. He wants you to give him all of your burdens. Oh, God, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. I do. Oh, Lord, what am I going to do if I know? And if you give him your burdens, he'll take care of them. And listen, sometimes anxiety hits. I get it. I know. It happens to me sometimes. And I go, what am I anxious about? Listen, I woke up at 1.30 this morning. I thought I was going to get this great revelation from the Lord. I waited and waited and waited and waited and then anxiety. And then as I'm leaving the house this morning, I go, I told my wife, what was I anxious about? What was that? It's just demonic. It's demonic. Give it to the Lord. Cast your cares upon him. God gave me a, a, a lesson as I'm teaching this, things are going to happen. Things are going to make you anxious. Things are going to make you nervous. Put it away. It's not from God. God's not going to ever go, I'm going to make my son, my daughter anxious. There's no darkness in God at all. No shadow of turning. He's not even capable of it. Unless you're his enemy. Unless you're his enemy. And we see that in scripture. Those who are enemies of God don't have a good time. But his children? Now, cast your cares. Cast your cares. He, he, he loves to take your burdens so that he can free you. Or, or what father, what mother in here, if you see your child burdened? Just imagine your child carrying a heavy weight. And if they let it go, it's going to crush their feet. And you see them struggling. They're sweating. And you just go, oh, I don't know what you're going to do. You've got a long way to go. What kind of parent are you? No, you're going to relieve that burden. Go, okay, I got it. You did good job, good job carrying it up to here. I'm glad you gave it to me. And you're going to walk with that child and put it where it needs to go. That's That's what a caring parent does, right? How much more our God, how much more our God who loves us and cares for us and he wants our heavy burdens, gang, and and we need to give it to him. And, And listen, here's the reason. Because we need to be sober. Peter says, be sober. Not not drunk. Not not drunk. Not physically drunk. Not emotionally drunk. Just, you know, emotionally drunk. Always laughing and having a good time. And, and, well, why can't we have a good time? Why can't we have... I thought we were supposed to have joy. Yes, you're supposed to have joy. You're not supposed to laugh like, you know, a hyena or something. You know? To be serious, be sober, be sober-minded. You know, be, be vigilant. Because your adversary, and you have an adversary, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, he's your adversary. No friend of yours. He wants you dead, wants to destroy you. It's what he does, it's what he lives for. He hates God's creation. He hates who you are. He hates that you celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ on Sundays. He hates everything. But understand how limited in power he is. 
How many of you were killed this morning on the way to church? Nobody? Wow. No, you were not killed. Now listen. You know, Satan was trying to kill you on the way to church this morning. It's what he wanted. Didn't succeed. It should tell you something. Stop thinking that Satan is all-powerful. Do we, do we fight him head on? Well, of course, we t- we've already taught this. No, of course not. Even Michael didn't, didn't you know, bring accusation against him. He said, the Lord Jesus Christ rebuke you. And that's what we need to do. Stand behind Jesus, man. Right? And why? And here's the reason. Here's the reason. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Now, we've all seen the Discovery Channel, right? You've seen that hungry lion. Hides behind a couple of blades of grass. Why does the, the antelope not see it? <laughs> Don't you have a smeller? Well, that smeller's not working because all of a sudden he goes, especially deer. Deer are just dumb. <laughs> Run. <laughs> Run. Don't look. It's like when you were driving down the road. Mm, here comes the deer and all of a sudden he looks at you and he just stops. What are you looking at? Run! Well, I mean, that's, that's what Christians do. That's what Christians do. Satan is, he, he's there prowling. He's walking about like a, a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. Well, how's he going to devour me if God doesn't allow him? No, no, it's where you walk. It's how, it's how you walk. It's what you're doing. It's, it's the topless place that has happy hour at 5 o'clock. You say, well, well I won't look and I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll buy two drinks and save money. I'm a good steward. Convincing yourself that that's where you belong. Hey, it's a long weekend and I get to relax. What's the problem with going into ABC Liquors, man? And there's Satan, like a roaring lion going, that's right. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, he may not pounce you the first time you go in. As a matter of fact, the first time you go in that first weekend might be all right. But he'll wait for the second. He might wait for the third. And eventually, he will pounce you. He will pounce you. All of a sudden, you're three drinks in when you get an emergency call from somebody that they need your help. And you get behind the wheel of your car. And all of a sudden, there's flashing lights behind your car, and you go, what in the world? I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose everything. Or God forbid you hit a pedestrian or you hit another car. It just started with a weekend of drinking. It seemed innocent. But Satan, just looking for an opportunity, like a roaring lion, he comes to seek, to kill, and destroy, John 10.10 10 tells us. And those words came from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ who created him. He said he's a liar from the beginning. He's a father of lies. And we need to be, listen, sober, vigilant, always watching, always watching. Imagine a a dad has three kids sleeping upstairs, but he doesn't have a front door on his house and he lives in a rough neighborhood. Is that father going to go to sleep? Not if he's worth his salt. No, he'll be sitting there on the front step with a shotgun as his kids sleep. He's being vigilant. He's going to watch out. He's going to protect. God says, man, we need to watch out. We need to be knowing, listen, that the roaring lion is always on our heels. Don't ever slow down. Don't ever back up. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. But I I don't know how we're supposed to do How do we do that? Here it is right here, verse 9. Resist him. Resist him. Well, how do you resist him? Uh, I go in a supermarket. You know what I do? I miss that aisle that has all the beer and wine in it. You know what I'm saying? I go from here, taco chips, (laughs) some nachos, some pretzels, put that in the cart. Beer and wine, nothing good there. Yodels, yeah, this is the aisle. You know what I mean? Resist them. It's easy. Walk past it. Don't just go down the aisle just to take. 
You know what I'm saying? What are you doing? You're flirting with disaster. Especially if you were a drinker. Especially if you were a drinker. I'm going to leave it alone at that point. You resist them. Listen, steadfast in faith. Steadfast. Stand on the word of God and God's promises. God will never let you down. If you take God at his word, he will never, ever let you down. When God says go, you go in his power. God, it doesn't look like anything's going to happen here. Don't worry about what it looks like. God, I, I don't know if I feel this so much. Don't worry about your feelings. Be obedient, be disciplined, and go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will give you victory. Man, be steadfast in your faith. And listen, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Man, I struggle just like you struggle. We go through the same thing. The brothers that I met at the beaches, they struggle the same way. Man, the people that you're trying to reach out on the street, they struggle the same way. We all have to walk this life. And if you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, newsflash, it's never going to be easy. I don't know why so many Christians get sidelined because, oh, it just wasn't easy. Life wasn't easy. This person didn't like me. They're not supposed to like you. They hated your king. If they hated Jesus Christ, who was all love, all grace, all compassion, what are they supposed to do with you? Just think about that for a moment. Man, they're supposed to hate everything about us. We're going to be doing a baptism soon. They hate that we do baptisms. They call it stupid. I just stupid. No, well, it's commanded. Commanded that we get baptized. Gang, when we walk with the Lord, we walk contrary, contrary to the, world, the way the world work, uh, walks. And at any time, if you feel yourself walking with the world, please know that you're walking against Christ. You are backslidden. There's nobody here in neutral. Well, I'm not exactly backslidden, but I'm not on fire either. No, 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 no. You're backslidden. There is no neutral in Jesus Christ. There's always moving forward, always going forward, always learning, being blessed, and listen, being commissioned for the next mission. That's what God is doing. And let me say this, for anybody who's sitting in, in any of these seats and you're not serving at some capacity somewhere, doesn't have to be here necessarily, but you're not serving anywhere. You just, I come in on Sundays, I get the message, and I go home. Gang, listen, you are totally missing out on what Christianity is all about. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless others. Love others. Lay down your life for others. That's New Testament Christianity. The cults will tell you something different. The cults will have you doing something different. But serving others is all what Jesus is he's all about. It's what he, he can The greatest one ever. And scripture says that knowing that all things were put in his hands. In other words, everything was now under Jesus' control. He's the king, the undisputed king. All power, all authority, everything given to him. Again, I said this last week, he girded himself in a servant's towel and he washed feet. It's mind-blowing. And he did this, what? To leave an example for us. For us. Right there, that's some, that's some heavy revy for those of you that are paying attention. And I hope you are. Just resist them. 
He says, but, listen, verse 10, may the God of all grace who called us, that should be underlined in your Bibles, he called us, to his eternal glory, not temporal, eternal glory, life forever. By Christ Jesus, listen, and I don't really like these words, but I'm going to say them. After you have suffered a while. How long is that? What's a while, Lord? After you've suffered a while. Well, why do we got to put that verse in there? Why do we got to do that? Why can't you just tell me what's coming and I don't have to suffer it? Because listen, sometimes there's pain in the offering. And we grow more through that pain and through that sorrow than we ever do through the good times. God is seasoning us, establishing us. Well, let's let the Word of God tell us. After you've suffered a while, listen, He's going to perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Now, I can preach on this for an hour, but I won't. After you've suffered a while, Satan's whole plan, he wants you to feel sorry for yourself. He wants you to think that you are alone or exclusively suffering like nobody else. That's his plan. Oh, woe is me. You don't know what I'm going through. And we all have that going on. Every one of us. Every time we get through a trial, maybe it was, a, I don't know, a surgery that you had to get through. Maybe it was a cancer diagnosis. We all have that feel sorry for myself. God, I don't deserve this. Well, nobody deserves it, but what God's trying to do is trying to polish you because he wants you to come like fine gold. Maybe it was COVID. Maybe COVID almost killed you. And you go, Lord, this can't be the way I'm checking out. Lord, you got to be kidding me. They can get to a point where, man, I start feeling sorry for myself. Well, when I had my surgery, Lord, you got to be kidding me. I'm sidelined. Lord, I want to be preaching. I want to be reaching. I want to be telling people about you. Lord, and here I'm in a bed? Are you, Lord, this can't be your plan, Lord. Oh, woe is me. Eh. We all do it. Then my wife walks in. You going to get up? It's been a day. No, it's been a week and a half. Time to get up. And she was an encourager. You need to get outside. You need to get some air. And then, you know, I had that little rolling cart thing. And you know, I finally got the energy to get into that thing and go outside. And I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do it. And as soon as the breeze hit me, it was like, yes, freedom. But the Lord says, I, I, I want to perfect you. And that word, that word uh, perfect, it, it's a strange word. The word perfect or perfect, it's teleos in the Greek. That's not this word. The teleos is it, without a blemish, perfect. This word is Let's say you fell off a building and every one of your bones went all over the floor. This word, he's going to put them all back together and make you right. I like this. Want to know why? Because some of you have suffered for a while. And some of you feel like there's parts of your life that are missing. You feel broken up. You don't feel complete. You don't really know what's going on, but you know it's not just not, something's not right with me, Lord. This tells me that the day is coming. He's going to put it all back together. He's going to put it all back together. He's going to make you right. He's going to perfect you. Listen, he's going to establish you. My, my favorite way to look at this is, uh, if you have Acts 
chapter 20. If you wouldn't mind, put that on the screen. If you don't have it, it's okay. One of my life verses, there it is, 20 and 24. This is the, this is the established, he talks, because, you know, Paul was on the, on the aisle there on the beach of Miletus, and they're telling him how much he's going to suffer, how he's going to die, how he's going to be just destroyed. And he goes, but none of these things move me nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. It's become one of my life verses. I wasn't always here. I've arrived here. God has done this in my life. I've arrived here. None of these things move me. Oh, people don't like you. None of these things move me. People speak bad about you. None of these things move me. People love you in the church. None of these things move me. All I want to do is serve him and do right by him. That on that day, I have nothing to be ashamed of, knowing that I served him. That's the establishing that we're talking about here in 1 Peter. That you know that you know, and you are unmoved, you are unshaken. That every little thing that comes along, oh, now it's monkeypox. Okay. None of these things move me. It could kill you. I doubt it. But if it does, it does. I don't like monkeys anyway. (laughs) I put them right there in the cat category. Monkeys are annoying. I watch videos of monkeys. They're nasty, nasty little animals. It's like having kids. <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? Sorry. <laughs> that he can perfect you, establish us, and strengthen you. Not in your strength, in his strength. That you're depending and standing on the word of God. God, I'm taking you at your word. You said you would. Lord, I believe you. When you said, Lord, that we're going to go to the other side, You didn't say that we're going under. You said we're going over to the other side. Lord, I'm taking you at your word. I believe you, Lord. I trust you. That's the strength that he wants you to garner. Listen, in him. And he wants to settle you. Settle you. Um, Again, reminds me of uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 4. Do we have that for the boy? Hey, man, own it. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Listen, God is saying, I want to establish you. I want to perfect you. I want you to stand. I want you to stand. I don't want you to bow down to these pressures. I want to settle you. That you know that you know that you know. And to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Man, suffering develops Christian maturity. Unfortunately, that's how we have to go through it. Man, let's let's learn from our sufferings. There's always something there to learn from our times of suffering. And you know that you're victorious when that suffering develops character. Solid Christian character. That when that trial comes again, you say, I've been here before. And I'm just going to stand. I'm going to let the Lord protect me. And how important that is, you know, for a leader, a leader in the church of any, of any kind, any kind of leader, male, female, regardless. It, how important that is to learn that lesson. A, a leader, listen, is one who knows the way. One who knows the way. One who shows the way. And one himself who goes that way. That's a leader, and we only, we only get there, man, through these experiences. The church, the church needs to remain a hospital, not a country club. It needs to remain a hospital. It needs to be here for the hurting and those that have wounds that need healing. Verse 12 says, by Sylvanus, that would be also the name Silas, same person. Our faithful brother, as I consider him, that's what Peter's saying, uh, Silas was the man who actually 
penned this letter for Peter. They say Silas was a, uh, a very brilliant man with an under, un- unbelievable understanding uh, for the Greek language to write a letter like this. This letter was disputed for years, this one and, and Second Peter, disputed for years and years and years because they said there's no way that a fisherman from Galilee could have written a letter like this. But if they would have just read it carefully, it would have told him, well, he actually didn't pen it. He spoke it, and Silas wrote the words by the power of the Holy Spirit through uh, Silas. He says, uh, he's written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. Not in which you fall, not in which you cower, in which you stand. Then he says, she who is in Babylon, again, they would write in code because if this letter was intercepted, uh, they needed to protect. It says, she who is in Babylon, uh, the she there is the church, uh, who is in Babylon, it's the new Babylon, we would understand it to be Rome. That's where Peter was in his final days. Uh, that's where uh, Peter was uh, martyred, and uh, they say his body's there at the, the basilica. And there's, there's actually really good evidence to prove that Peter actually died there. And they consider him the first pope. Um, no comment. I'll leave it alone. That's low-hanging fruit. Um, but she who is in Babylon, Rome, the church, elect... That is the elect among us. That's uh, the church, the elect ones. Together with you, greets you. And so does Mark, my son. That would be John Mark, the the gospel writer of Mark. Uh, My son. Now, now Peter didn't have a son. That wasn't his biological son. It was his son in the faith. Uh, John Mark got close to Peter. And here, towards the end of his life, he says, and so does Mark. John Mark was there. Uh, with him in Rome in those final days. He says, greet one another with a kiss of love. This is something that we're going to begin implementing today. (laughs) Please understand that this was the custom of the day. May I never see my young brothers kissing up on any of the females saying this is godly. (laughs) Amen? (laughs) Okay. And now listen, you laugh, but there's a lot of cults out there and cult leaders that use this text to have freedom to do what they want with their congregation. May God have mercy on their souls is all I can say. Now, if a brother wants to go up to another brother and kiss him on the cheek and give him a big hug... That's between y'all two. You know what I'm saying? The world that I come from, that happens. And it's a sign of respect. My brother Mike, um, who who I miss terribly, used to greet me every Sunday with a handshake, a hug, and a kiss. And I expected it. I expected my sons, they greet me with a kiss. I expect it. Um, uh, Floyd? Mm Mm-mm. Mm -mm, That beard ain't happening, man. And I love him. I love him. I don't know why I'm picking on Floyd today. I love him. But uh, mm -mm, mm -mm, ain't happening. I don't let Frank greet me with a kiss. None of that. None of that. Handshake, fist bump. That's about maybe a hug once in a while if I feel sorry for him. (laughs) Happens. So we don't do this in the church any longer because it is not part of our culture. Amen? All right. You've been warned. Okay. It, it just, it's incredible how things get so out of hand and so wacky. It's, it's amazing to me. Um, he says, greet one another with a kiss of love. Today it's a fist bump. And he says, peace to all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, he doesn't know he's about to write Second Peter. He thinks that's him. He's signing off. He's, I'm out of here. I can see they're already preparing a... Uh, a cross for me to be crucified on. They want me to pay the heaviest price. 
They want to hurt me. All right. So be it. Suffer for a little while. God's going to perfect. He's going to establish. And it's going to be a day where I'm going to see my Savior real soon. And imagine Peter. Man, he loved the Lord. He missed him. And he's about to see his Savior once again. And he knows, he's convinced. And he's saying, listen, man, respect your elders. Man, listen to those in authority. And to those in authority, be careful how you treat the flock of God. Man, love them. Honor them. Cherish them. And in closing, let me say this, gang. I... And our, our other pastors, our elders, and our, our deacons, now we have, we have seven. Gang, we do the best that we can possibly do to bless this congregation. Um, you know, the fellowship, the food afterwards, you know, we don't do the, hey, $5 a plate thing. And, you know, we, we, we freely receive, we freely give. We want to bless you. We want to come alongside you. We want to help you in and through this life. Please don't do this alone. Please. If you're hurting, if you're lonely, if there's something going on in your life and you just need somebody to come alongside you, please, my first, my first exhortation to you would be this. Get involved in what the church is doing. Be here. Serve here. Let somebody know who you are. Man, this is... This is, the best, this is the best thing I've ever been a part of. I've never been a part of anything like this. You know, it, 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 and he's not in here. And I think he's out there doing security, so let me talk about him. You know, you got Derek Milos. One week he's out there doing, you know, parking lot stuff. Then he's over there cooking chicken wings for the congregation. Today he's, he, he's doing duty here in the... Uh, in the Breezeway. Man, that's what, that's what love looks like. That's what, that's what service to the Lord looks like. And I'm just bringing him up, you know? And, and, and listen, the guy wears flip-flops. He's not perfect. <laughs> but that's what, it, that's what it looks like. And you know, Derek gets to know everybody. Those who are serving, they get to know everybody. I love how these guys, man, they, 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 they rib on each other. I love it. I love it, man. This is, this is Christian brotherhood. I love how the sisters gather together. I love it. It's important that we do. And listen, and if you're not part of any of that that's going on, please let me encourage you. Let it start with, man, you want to clean the church on Saturdays, you'll get to meet people. At the very least, be part of the Brick House Fellowship afterwards. Nobody in this congregation that calls this their church home should feel disconnected. Nobody. Nobody. And uh, my prayer is for you, that you'd be blessed and that you would feel the love of Christ in this place. We pray for it constantly. Um, and that's all I got. For all of you that are uh, watching from home, God bless you. Hey, listen, if this message has touched your heart, I don't know what your church home is, but go back there and be the spark in that place and make it the most loving church in America or around the world. God bless you. Thanks for watching.